evening, everybody. Good evening. All right. We made it. Well, almost. It's Friday night. So uh, I, I thank, uh, make sure I get all this kind of stuff out. Thanks for having me here. Um, you know, I, Ethan called me, I don't know, back in maybe November, late October, and talked to me about, you know, doing a meeting down at Glencoe that was different. You know, what, what did I think about doing something two hours a night for five nights? I just didn't think, it's like, there's just no way people's going to come out and sit for five nights for two hours. And I don't know if I can keep my own attention for five nights for two hours <laughs> is how I felt about it. And I just, you know, it wasn't something I'd ever done before. So um, I was like, yeah, sure, we'll try. And then uh, within no time, he's like saying, hey, what if we extended that to another week and we did that over in Liberty? I was like, well, you know, yeah, I guess we can do that. And then the idea was that was done on, that was the week of February the 5th, right in there. And that was my, um, that was my first week doing this. And really, I think if I remember right, he was trying to lay those a lot closer together. But we were having... Gina was going into tax season. We had the lady who works with her. Um, she was having surgery, and we really did not know how that was coming out. So I was like, guys, we got to get this thing pushed past a April 15th. And then we'll, well, then, you know, the dates were getting really hard because they were here, they were there. And, you know, next thing I know, it's kind of between Jake and Ethan, and they're jockeying back and forth on dates. And I'm like, ah, it's going to go down. We'll never get this second week done. Then I get a call back. We're going to stick with that date, brother, and we're going with that when we're going to do it. So... Anyway, appreciate where you guys have put us up. That's just a beautiful place. You know, I've been telling people back home, I'm like, I'm in the mountains of Indiana. I, I didn't know there was such a thing, but you can be in the mountains of Indiana. And it's, it's been beautiful up there. And uh, it was kind of neat. You know, believe it or not, it's, it's pretty crazy. But between Gina's birthday, which happens in October, and between our anniversary, which happens in May on the 13th, Believe it or not, we were married actually on Friday the 13th. That's the date we were, we were actually married. And um, so I, between those two dates and me preaching, most of the time we were in revivals at those two dates. So, you know, we're like, well, we pulled it off again. I was, uh, you know, it was actually my birthday in February the 5th there whenever we started that meeting. And then whenever we started this one, it's our anniversary. But we couldn't have got a better anniversary present from you guys not even knowing it than that cabin. It, it's been really nice up there. So just thanks so much for, uh, for uh, seeing, the, seeing that through. And, and just, it's, uh, we took pictures. We, we put our camera on that 10 second delay so we could actually take pictures with both of us in it. You know, we like, we just thought it was nice. Uh, thanks to y'all who listened to me and I, you know, we got grippos, you know <laughs> I went home last night went to the cabin last night I took the bread that everybody made fun of because I hadn't and I cut that bread and made a ham and cheese sandwich with that bread And then I felt pulled out grippos and then I'll, I'll you know it just uh, It was it was it's been really good. So thank you all y'all are a wonderful group of people we'll try to get through uh, the last of this and uh, I'll try to I believe somewhere in this tonight in case I don't get to it I, one thing I'm pretty well sure that I got um, wrong last night after going back and looking at it and uh, that was the feast of in gathering I believe after a closer look should be tied into the feast of tabernacles I think it's also called the feast of in gathering um, that whenever you get all these extra names, I wish they would have just went with one name because because it really gets difficult for me to keep those and maybe it's not important, but I hate to I hate to put out information and and uh, and it be be wrong. But sometimes sometimes it's very hard for me to tell. But I believe in looking that it really should go with the way it's said in the statement. It should go with the uh, the feast of tabernacles because it says at the end of the year. Anyway, so we've looked at. <coughs> Passover and we've looked at bread and we've looked at uh, 
And then we skip down about 49 plus 1, 50 days to Pentecost. Okay, and two of these are pilgrim feasts, which they came back for, and all of these are considered the spring feasts. Now, most of everything that really I've talked to you about so far, there's not much of, uh, of, of any of this is not actually a consensus on the fulfillment with Christ. Some of these are so obvious. You know, whenever you think about it, you're seeing things go on. You're seeing Christ on the cross. You're seeing the church start. And then you go back and look that on Pentecost, they were uh, connecting that with the giving of the law, the covenant right there. And then you go to the New Testament. What do we see? We see a church start. We see the beginning of the new covenant. So some of this stuff is just so obvious that you just, you know, whenever you actually go back and look at it, you can't miss. <coughs> now, we come in now to what's called the fall feast. And the fall feasts are not like the spring feast because they are much more um, debated. In fact, I don't even know if debated is a good word. Majority of the things that I've seen written about them lean towards the idea that they are yet to be fulfilled. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm going to say that it looks like to me from Scripture it would be important that all these be fulfilled in Christ and the work he did. And I'll try to talk about that and explain um, why that I would come from that direction with them. Uh, you know, and I think we'll even see some scripture that would lean towards that way. But I'm telling you, this is where everybody jumps the boat into a, a different direction. And I'll, I've got some book pictures in here for you to see that have been published and Little did I know they were based on these. That's where the basis for these was these feasts right here and how they were figuring up times, how people figure up. You know, you know, there's always somebody guessing around when the Lord's going to return, right? And whenever you look, you'd find out that that's what they're matching these things up by. They're going by these feast days and trying to figure out when Jesus would return by those things. And uh, we'll look and we'll try to look for a, a reasonable uh, look at these. But let's go to the Feast of the Trumpets first. Now, the Feast of the Trumpets is going to start a little different than are the other feasts in time that it's going to start. So we're going to go to Leviticus 23. We've worn that page out, haven't we, right there. Leviticus 23. And uh, if somebody will read verses 23 through 25, we'll see how this kind of gets started off here. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, First of the month you shall have a rest, a reminder by blowing of trumpets of holy convocation. You shall do no any laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. Okay, so whenever we come to the Feast of Trumpets, we don't really see um, a whole lot about what's going on, other than they're going to blow trumpets, is what they're going to do. And you might notice that it's in the seventh month and on the first of the month. And it's also a Sabbath, okay? They're, they're going to do the Sabbath thing on that, that day too. So we're now, um, we saw the month Nisan was heavy with Passover and unleavened bread and um, first fruits. And then Pentecost, um, Savan is the month, I believe. And then we drop on down to um, the next one. And we're in the month of Tishri, which is kind of our month of September and October. Kind of falls in between. There. Um, let's look at another scripture about this. Let's do Numbers chapter 29 and verse 1. Okay, we didn't learn much there. You know, kind of got a repeat of what we, uh, what we had seen before. And if we looked over in Ezra, in chapter 3, <laughs> verses 1 through 6, is it really the only place in Scripture that we actually see that they seem to have celebrated the feast? And can anybody think, where in time and history are we whenever Ezra is pinned down? Okay, they get to come back, and they're going to build the temple back, 
And then in Nehemiah's time, he's going to build the wall. So that's the rebuilding. We would call Ezra and Nehemiah time of rebuilding right there. It's what that would be. So it's during that time of rebuilding there that we see that uh, these feasts, and if anybody would read Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, this is as close as we'll see to them, like, you know, what, what anything about the feast at all. Okay. Okay, so in this little section right here is the only time we read anything about the actual, you know, something going on with the Feast of the Trumpets. And we actually, when you read down through there, you also see about the Feast of Booths, which another name for that is what? Tabernacles, okay? And I'll, I'll tend to probably use that tabernacles more, but same one. So um, we brought the trumpet in early in this, I think maybe even in the first night. And... Uh, I have a feeling, you know, this is actually, it's a good looking trumpet, you know, well, a good looking uh, ram's horn, and uh, I have a feeling that what they probably use is bigger, that's what I think, I think that, you know, you're probably going to, you're going to find that ram's horn that's kind of showy, and they're going to blow that ram's horn whenever it is the first of the month, and you think, that's no big deal, well, evidently, from everything that's known about it, it is a big deal. And this is something that I'm somewhat, I, I, don't, I guess in the modern thinking, I don't know. It, it, it confuses me just a little bit. But anyway, everything I read goes like this. All right, when, when do we have a new moon? I mean, the, you know, we're, we're still talking what we would see today is, is when, when would we have a new moon? Pay no attention to the writing on the screen. No. <laughs> All, right. All right. The new moon is whenever there's no moon, okay, whenever it's dark. Okay, so I think that next slide, I don't know how well this will come out. Okay, because I don't know all this stuff very well. I mean, I kind of know you show me a half moon, you show me a crescent moon. I kind of I kind of get that, but four is under, I don't. I don't look up a lot, <laughs> you know, than, to, and mostly when I do look up is whenever it's the full moon, and I can really see it big and bright, you know, it's kind of standing out, and then, uh, hey, did you guys have that, um, did y'all have those lights down here a couple of, uh, like last weekend? Y'all did have them? Honestly, tell me the truth, could you see them very well without your, cam without your phone or camera? All right. I mean, we we were we already went to bed, and I'm telling I'm saying Gina, people are putting up these beautiful skit pictures of the sky, so she like gets up and looks out. <laughs> well, it does look a little purple, but you know like like well here we are again. We never get to have all the fun everybody else does. And then I think it's finally it's like David Bentley puts up something about you know put your camera on night focus or something and do that. And so I, and next thing I know, Gina's out of her you know she's like out of bed and outside and in, my in her pajamas like out in the fence trying to get some pretty lights and I don't know that didn't have anything to do with the moon though did it had, Sorry. had something to do with the northern lights and, and solar storms or something like that so anyway never mind all that it's not that important we uh, back to this so whenever the the new moon is the moon looks like that to us <coughs> where basically you don't see a moon so Whenever they're at the middle of the month, 
So, so if you think about it, okay, whenever they're at Passover, then at the 15th of the month, they're really at the full moon. So they're, they're seeing, you know, moon's bright, got a lot of light at night. But this festival here is different. It's the only festival that starts at the first of the month, which is no moon. Everything that you read on this says that they had a couple of witnesses. And they actually, I don't think it was just for the, the trumpets, for the Feast of Trumpets. I think it was for every month. But they had witnesses that watched the moon phases. And whenever there was no sliver of moon, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to ask dumb questions about this. I know it's moving, but I don't know how much, you know, how much difference would you see in one night? Would you see, you know, would you see a little bit of difference? None of us have really looked up to pay any attention to this, have we? So I've been, been thinking about this, like, since I was reading this, because I get the impression in reading it that they had witnesses that are looking for the very moment that they've got the new moon. And whenever they had it, they reported it to the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin would only take it whenever they had two witnesses. And whenever they got their two witnesses, then they would, you know, announce the new moon of the Feast of the Trumpets. But I believe... The more I read, I get the impression this was something they did every month. It wasn't only on, I mean, it's not like they have the Feast of the Trumpets every month, but it's like they've got people telling them, you know, and, and then from that point, they would direct their, their months, you know, to get their days right. Uh, so anyway, that's the way I understand that. So in a lot of ways, this, food, this, this feast is very dark it's you know not really well known on exactly you got a rough idea when it's going to start but you got to wait until they blow the trumpets so that you know it started and then you kind of got a sabbath day going on whenever this is uh this is new moons here my understanding is that later that they actually allowed a couple of days for the feast of the trumpets so that they would make sure they got the day right you know i and like I say, that's just doing some reading and how they, they understand it. But that's how they basically calculated these things. So the Feast of Trumpets, and there's not, I mean, there's, we're just doing what we're saying. We're having a Sabbath day, we're blowing the trumpets, and, you know, we're watching for the new moon so we can get this started right. But that's about what this feast includes right here. But this month is basically near the whole month is in celebration because you're going to make it next to the Day of Atonement, and then you're going to make it next to the Feast of Tabernacles. So you put all those things together, and you're pretty much running the month of what we would call September to October is a celebration month. So once again, and whenever we get to the Feast of Tabernacles, I'm going to assume that uh, because it's a pilgrim feast again, Tabernacles is, and it's seven days, that you are going to... Uh, I, w I would think if I was a family living at that time, I'm probably going to want to be there for the rest of the festivities, if I could do it. But here's been one of my biggest difficulties in understanding this, and I was talking to you about it last night. You know, they're here for Passover, and I know they're staying through this part, and then I guess you go back home, and realistically, I mean, how long does it take to walk 70 miles, if that's where you live? And if you, you, if you think about in Acts in chapter... Um, eight, the Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. I mean, it's little doubt the Ethiopian eunuch had been to Jerusalem for a feast day. So we're, we're, I mean, there's zero doubt we're talking about a proselyte Jew or Jewish person who came back to uh, Jerusalem. And then he comes out of there and what's he doing? He's sitting there in his chariot and he's reading Isaiah. Because he, you know, no doubt the talk in Jerusalem has been very simple. There's this fella, he was here, he did all these miracles. And then he was killed on a cross, and he raised again on the third day. And these scriptures in Isaiah 53 talk about him. And others would tell him, no, those scriptures aren't about him. They're about the writer, or they're about Israel or something. They're not about him. So, you know, there's no doubt that that's probably why he was there. In fact, I would just say, no doubt that is why he was there. Because that he had traveled from Ethiopia to make a pilgrim trip back to Jerusalem for one of these feast days right here. I just, in my mind, it's like, how do you spend that much time out of a year <laughs> away from home? I just can't figure out how they got everything done. But I, you know, I guess that's what would be my, uh, you know, difficult with it is, is that. Because uh, what I was getting to a while ago, okay, so you take Jesus, for example, which technically, compared to how a lot of people come, didn't live that far away. But guys, how long would it take us to walk 70 miles? 
would take a couple of days at least, right? Four days. I mean, I was trying to think, whenever Jesus is 12 years old, he gets lost, right? I was, how, how long does that, that, does it give us a time frame in that, in Luke 2? Jake, does that give us a time frame? I'm sitting here trying to think. They, they don't know that he's missing for a while because he's, is it three days? He's missing three days. So you think about that. I mean, that means they're journeying that long to get by. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it's mind-boggling to me, guys, you know, what that they did versus how we live today. So, uh, I don't know. Okay, that's kind of the Feast of the Trumpets. That's literally all we're going to do with that. Now I've got to get back over here. And the next one we're going to go to that happens after the Feast of the Trumpets is the Day of Atonement. And we want to go to Leviticus 16. A little different chapter than maybe what we've been in a lot of the time. Leviticus 16, and we'll get somebody to read verse 29 for us. Leviticus 16, 29. Hey, Darren, just yeah. for the recording, first, yes. I know it's not that important, but it was a day that they were gone. When they came back, it was three days to find it. Okay. And they were gone for one day. Okay, they were gone. They had traveled they for... days journey. Okay, they had made a day's journey, and then they, they travel three days back. Or three well, days in... Okay. Back and looked for three they're, days. they're looking for him for three days. They found him on the third day. Okay, all right. So they found him on the third day. Do you guys get that? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, thank you uh, very much. Okay, so Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. Okay, now, this is one of lots of stuff about this one. This one here is very involved. We'll lightly skim some of the things that they would do to try to put it in perspective on what's going to go on. Um, every now and then, I think I do hear this one, Yom Kippur. You ever hear them throw out that name and stuff? That's Day of Atonement. And whenever you hear that, it comes from the root of cover, to cover, and if you think about um, uh, the mercy seat that's set on top of the ark, <coughs> that is sometimes referred to as a covering, right there. So, uh, no doubt, you know, whenever we uh, look at these things, there's a connection in there with blood, you know, in one way or another, and atonement and covering, right there. So you can kind of think about all those things together and what they mean. Now. Um, did you notice in that particular verse, in verse 29 that we read, there was this statement that was made. Your souls, let's see, you shall humble your souls and not do any work. Okay? Now, isn't that a strange little statement, don't you guys think? Does anybody have anything else there but that little statement? Afflict your souls, okay? I don't, uh, you know, there's always things I don't completely understand. That was, that's the idea of a fast right there. So I don't, I don't always know how we, you know, when I read something, I don't always read it and understand it. Like, I guess that it should have been understood and that would be one of those things. But I did know already that the only day that the Jewish people were ever required to fast on is the Day of Atonement. Now, you've got to think about that because there's a lot of times that fasting shows up in the New Testament, okay? And um, they even had some issues with fasting, if you think about it. Jesus made mention of some of that on how people looked whenever they fasted, and he told them not to look like that. You know, put your best on, comb your hair, look up. You know, I mean, he, he's saying, don't look like you're fasting. Don't, don't, don't have everybody all feeling sorry for you and like you're all this and all great. He's like, just you do it yourself. You know, he's making a good point about that. But the actual day that they needed to fast on was the Day of Atonement. This was the day that they were actually going to fast. So the others, they'd kind of done on their own. You know, maybe chosen to do it as a vow or something to God. But uh, this is the only actual time they're required to fast. And um, we can see that in passing in Acts 27.9. So 
And, and this is kind of interesting to us today to think of what it had been called at that time. But if you go to Acts 27, 9, and somebody read that for us. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. All right, I know you didn't catch the Day of Atonement in there, but it really was. <laughs> Does anybody know where it was at in there? When the fast, you know, whenever it says, when the fast was already over, it's talking about the Day of Atonement. So that's another thing that gives us so much trouble is, you know, they had already come up with these shorter names for stuff on what they're calling it. And that just throws us off because, you know, we don't pick up on all that, you know, right there. And this is, I mean, Luke just kind of tells us this in telling us the story of the movement of Paul and in that he said when the fast had already passed so you know probably certain people could pick up on that easy but not me <laughs> you know I'm I want to read through it and I'm not really gonna I'm not gonna catch it at all is what I'm gonna do and then whenever you do you can kind of start picking up on oh, okay well I knew I know what time of year we are now and we're heading towards winter here okay so you know things start adding up a little more okay um, let's try we were in 16 right yeah, we were in 1629. If anybody still got that 16 passage, would somebody read us verses 1 through 4 there? Leviticus 16, 1 through 4. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they had approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Aaron shall enter by the holy place with this, with a bull for a sin offering, a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic, and the, and the linen undergarment shall be next to his body, and he shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with the linen turban, these are the holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. Okay. Uh, let me show you. This is not a great... I can never find the picture of the tabernacle I want. And it's pretty much all there. I was looking to see. I'm, I've got my notes done different tonight because Gina said I really butchered her PowerPoint slides. So <laughs> I'm following her stuff tonight. Okay. Now, you guys aren't going to have any trouble with these things here. Of course, this is the tabernacle, and the tabernacle was replaced by the temple. Solomon's temple will be the first, you know, hard structure that they'll have. But, you know, everything was actually based on this tabernacle. So what do we have out here? I wish I had a little pointer right now, but I don't. But we'll just kind of work our way in. What's that? Altar burnt offering. What's that there? Okay, labor. Okay, that. what's that way over there? I know. <laughs> we'll just kind of pick out something and call it out. Boy, they're, they're not very easy to see either. There's a lamp stand. The lamp stand, and what else you see? Okay, table of showbread. Yeah, there's an altar of incense. Boy, it's hard to see. Okay. And, and then we cross over in the other room where you see the Ark of the Covenant in there. And inside the Ark of the Covenant would be what? Aaron's rod that budded, golden jar of manna, and Ten Commandments, right? Okay, so we would have that in there. So I figured that would not be a, an issue. So we can go in and, and basically, you know, the whole thing from out, on the outside is about 45 feet wide and about 150 foot long, right? No, 75 feet wide, 150 foot long. And then the tabernacle itself is about 45 feet foot long and 15 foot wide and the first room is what about a 30 by 15 and the second room is about a 15 by 15 and I believe the height is 15 so 15 by 15 by 15 back there unfortunately nobody really went in that room at all other than how often once a year now on that once a year whenever the high priest went in that room he did go in more than once to make atonement for sin it was for different things, but you can kind of read and kind of get the feel for this. But did you notice whenever he was getting ready that he was to bathe his body in water? Okay, now it would be 
a ritual that before they went in to that tabernacle that they would like rinse in water. I believe it was more of a ceremonial thing daily. But once, whenever the, uh, this would go on, he would, it would be a full body wash that he would do completely. And whenever he did that, I mean, whenever you read the, you can get in and you can actually read some accounts from this um, on how this was done. It looks like he was near taking about five baths on that day, you know, because we got a lot of, you got a lot of ritual stuff going on here. So you're going to do this and you're going to bathe and you're going to do this and you're going to bathe. So he didn't look like he always does. And this is, this is the same person. I guess over here he was young and over here he was old. No. <laughs> it takes that long. <laughs> I, know, I don't really know why they, they felt it necessary to make him look different. But anyway, okay, so the high priest normally, his, uh, his outfit, I, you, can you imagine? Now, I, I think the Pharisees and Sadducees, they kind of made sure they were a little bit showy too with their outfits. But now you guys realize they don't show up until the New Testament. There is no Old Testament part that says you shall be you know, Pharisees and you shall be Sadducees. They show up in the Inner Testament and they're there by the time of Jesus. But as far as being like biblical characters in the priest, no, they weren't anything like that. They were just... They were, I've always heard the Pharisees were kind of brought in in the, whenever they thought the Greek language was going to destroy everything it, that Israel was, and they brought them in as kind of protectors of the law and stuff, and then they developed in what they were in Jesus' time. But, you know, while they were kind of fancy with their outfits, look at that high priest. And, uh, of course, he's got the, uh, uh, that, the, the thing with the 12 jewels on it. I'm sitting here drawing a blank. What's that called? It's called the breastplate. So simple. So simple. Somewhere on there, he's got he's got to have some pockets, I think, where that he carried those um, he carried the urm and the thummim. Like you don't really see a lot about the urm and the thummim during the time of David and Saul. You read you read a little bit about it, but basically somehow they use that to ask questions to God, and and God would answer them through the urm and the thummim. Um, that was one of the ways, but they, they just appear like maybe they were two stones, had some kind of writing on them. Been a lot of confusion over that. But then on the Day of Atonement, he didn't look like this. He didn't dress like this. He dressed more like this. It was a, you know, very plain, very backed, o backed off version of what the high priest usually looked like. And, um, you know, when, whenever you're thinking about what's going on in this day, you can kind of get in your head, well, that's more or less what we're seeing on this day is more of that and less of that right there. So um, this was something that they definitely spent some time getting ready for. Um, and, you know, and we're jumping around on this, but this is kind of how it is in finding stuff about it. Uh, it's, it's another one of those you can't look to just one spot. There's several spots. Numbers chapter 19, and if somebody would, we can get a good feel for this. If somebody will read verses 1 through 19 of Numbers chapter 1. I'm sorry, 1 through 10. Okay, hang on. It's Numbers chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Okay? Y'all ever look at anything and you see it and you can't get it out of your mouth right? Yep. Yeah. Every Sunday. Okay. Yeah, you, know, you, know, you know what I deal with. You know my pain. All right, so we're heading over to Numbers 19. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the statue of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel that they bring you an unblemished red heifer, in which is no defect, and on which a yoke has never been placed. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest, and shall be brought outside the camp, and be slaughtered in his presence. Next, Eliezer the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger, and sprinkle some of its blood toward the front of the eating <coughs> seven times. Then the heifer shall be burnt in his sight. Its hide and its flesh and its blood, which is refused, shall be burnt. The priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet material and cast it into the midst of the burning heifer. The priest shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and afterward come into the camp. But the priest shall be unclean until evening. The one who burns it shall also wash his cloths in water and bathe his body in water and shall be unclean until evening. 
Now a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place. And the congregation of the sons of Israel shall keep it as water to remove impurity. It is purification from sin. The one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And it shall be a perpetual statue to the sons of Israel and to the alien who sojourns among them. Um, <laughs> in trying to get the high priest ready to go in there, there is some like serious cleansing. My understanding is that the high priest was removed from everyone and put in some kind of high priest, at least during the time of Jesus, high priest quarters that they had to try to make sure that he didn't get, you know, unclean by anything. And then you've got right here, obviously we're seeing a lot about the red heifer right there. And the high priest was twice sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer to circumvent the possibility of him becoming unclean by touching something, dead body. Now, it every now and then, guys, in the recent times especially, I've had somebody mention something to me asking about the red heifer. So, oh, you're, that's not the red heifer. Don't you have a red heifer? Has he already been up there? Okay, there he is. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the red heifer has been a thing lately on, I, you know, they're raising red heifers. And, you know, I, I had a young man come to me, want to know more about the red heifers. It seems like, you know, every dispensational doctrine, they love to get into this red heifer thing and getting, you know, they got a red heifer ready. Well, obviously, if you got a red heifer, then you also have to have a high priest, don't you? Okay, so... Um, now you can pull up the next screen. And, and you know, th th they're breeding red heifers today in Israel, but the red heifer does no good without a priesthood. And there can be no priesthood because the genealogical records were destroyed at 70 AD. Now, um, let me pull up a couple of verses here for you that I want you to see. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 64. They searched among their ancestral registration but could not be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean, and what happened? Excluded. They were excluded from the priesthood. Maybe they did fit, but they didn't have what? Genealogy record. And because they didn't have those, they would not say that they were part of the priesthood, and they had to be excluded. And then there's also Numbers chapter 16, verse 40. But guys, it gets real difficult to think that something like this could come back whenever you're going to do it without a priesthood. Well, maybe that's, oh, Gene, I forgot to practice this. Go ahead and go to your next slide. This is going to get tough. Okay. All right. So, yeah, it says Dave at home at Google. That's kind of weird. All right. Here's, here's what I want you to do. All right. I want you to open up another window of Google, and it should pop up over here. I meant to practice this, and we didn't. So, just... Like, see if you, you just double click on a Google, and I think, uh, okay. Now, I want you to type up in there at the top, um, who is the high priest in Israel today, okay? Now, can anybody read that? I can. You can? What's it say? Israel has not had a high priest since the second temple was destroyed, so there is no high priest in Israel today. Don't make it gone. That's good. All right. Because then it's not fast. You can look up any document you want to look up. There is no high priest, and they'll point back to the fact they haven't had one since Titus come in with the Roman armies and destroyed the temples. So basically, we're talking about there hasn't been a high priest in Israel in 2,000 years. There is no gene. Whenever you go back and you read about how that Titus come in to Jerusalem and the temple, he destroyed everything in his path and everything that was there to make sure that nothing was left. These the the Jewish people who who were who were basically trapped in that city, but they weren't leaving. I mean, we're talking people who was making their last stand. They believed God was going to see them through this thing. Whenever all that went on. So they're dealing with the worst of the worst. But, you know, he goes in and he basically, 
you know, to get this thing settled, because these are considered, you know, they're always causing an uprise. But here at the last, the only way to get rid of this was basically to wipe out everybody. And that's exactly what he did, along with everything. So all his records are gone. So, I mean, you know, you can carry on about we're going to get a red heifer and we're going to have a high priest. You look at the biblical account. You can't do what the Bible says you can't do. So, I mean, all that stuff is just near impossible. And did she do a good job being able to do that on the spur of the... <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, let's go on a little further here with this. And uh, we're going to see a picture of a cow, of a bull. Well, I just kind of mentioned it, that it was there. It was number 1640, if you guys are writing stuff down. All right, so one of those uh, for him would be a bull, a young bull. And he would put his hands, and my understanding is he pressed down on there, and it was for his sins, that he's going to lay his sins upon that bull, and they're going <coughs> to, excuse me, <coughs> They're going to sacrifice that young bull, and then he is going to take that blood into the, the, into the Holy of Holies, and he is going to sprinkle some of that on the Ark of the Covenant. That's my understanding of how that went on. But that was not the only one. Let's go on to the next one here. Uh, now, if one, about uh, two years ago, down to Glencoe, some of you guys heard me do a sermon that had to do with this here. Because this is whenever we have two goats, and uh, one is for Yahweh, and the other for Azazel. Now, there's been um, Yahweh, the one that's for Yahweh is the one that's going to be sacrificed. Okay, the one that is for Azazel is the one that they're going to send out in the wilderness. Okay, now, I, there's no scripture about it that I can find. There's some allusions to it in the New Testament in other scriptures about scarlet and that kind of thing, but evidently they tied a scarlet uh, thread around uh, one of the horns of the one for Azazel. Now, um, the one for Azazel somehow has something to do, they don't really know what that word means, okay? They, it's one of those Hebrew words. You understand, Hebrew, Hebrew died. The Hebrew language actually died. They went into captivity, and they come out speaking a language. You may remember what language they were speaking when they come out of captivity. You remember Daniel, the book of Daniel? The book of Daniel isn't all in Hebrew. Some of it's written in another language. Anybody know what that is? Aramaic. Yeah, Aramaic. So they actually, Aramaic began to take over. And even during the time of Jesus, you'll hear some statements, especially with John. You know, Jesus said this in Aramaic. And they, you know, there's a lot of people believe, believe it's pretty common language about that time, uh, you know, because they had learned that coming out of captivity. But Hebrew actually died and was brought back to life. And in Israel now today, they do speak Hebrew. Uh, but it wasn't like, it was brought back to life by them. Once they settled there, it wasn't a language that they brought in speaking. So because of that, and because it, the language died, like the meaning to this word, and it doesn't show up but like a couple of times, they really don't know what it is. But they believe the first part means goat, and the second part means to send out, or something like that is what it means. So in English, it got translated like this. At first, it was called escape goat. I think if you look back to Tyndale's early English versions, it says escape goat, and then later it was shortened to scapegoat. And you and I are kind of familiar with that concept, right? Scapegoat. You know, that's somebody who's going to take the blame for something. That's what that is. And that's exactly what this goat did. It took the blame for something. So they kind of kept them separated. Now, my understanding was that goat was just to be let out into the wilderness, away from the camp, and then was to be let go. That's what was to happen. But later, just to make sure that the goat didn't come back, they backed the goat up to a cliff. So the goat would fall over the cliff and die, basically. And that way, they were sure the goat wasn't going to make it back to the cliff. Or if he did, he was, you know, it was kind of a scary goat at that time or something. But anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of went on, what went on there. And we see the, the difference between the two. Um, now I've got a little video, Gina, that kind of like shows the happenings of the Day of Atonement for you guys to watch. Do we need to check that again or uh, the, the sound? I cranked it pretty loud. Okay, so, so she'll control the volume, man.
And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place, with a young bullock for his sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the scapegoat and the other lot for the Lord. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. And he shall take the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord, and make an atonement for it, and shall take of the blood of the bullock, and of the blood of the goat, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And he shall wash his flesh with water, and offer his burnt offering, and the burnt offering of the people, and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you, to make an atonement for the children of Israel, for all their sins once a year. Okay. All right. I'm not convinced I got everything right in there. <laughs> Pretty well sure you had to wash your whole self, not sprinkle a little bit of water. But you guys, you guys kind of caught that anyway. Uh, but uh, I always thought it would be neat. I mean, one year for a vacation Bible school, we built a tabernacle outside. You know, like, that wouldn't that be neat, Jake, if you guys do that this summer? If you do, I'll come down and see it. I'm excited already. Yeah. I'll think about it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let me show you just a couple different scriptures. So that kind of gives you, you know, sometimes hands-on pictures give us a little better idea. Uh, let's think about this verse in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. Um, let me just put this thought out there to you. Now, there's, you know, everything is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The, whenever they, whenever they put something on the altar outside and that sacrifice was made, don't forget that they had to take the blood and make atonement for it inside, okay, on the Day of Atonement. So, you know, one is done out here, 
one is done in here. So, I, you know, that gives us something to think about in Hebrews in chapter 9. And later, we're going to take a closer look at Hebrews chapter 9. In fact, somehow, I think I got some of this doubled up, but that's okay. Um, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. And somebody read that for us. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Okay. Whenever you read chapter 9, chapter 9 is about the tabernacle in the book of Hebrews. It's one of the clearest books to go to and see that. But not only is it about the tabernacle, it's about the Day of Atonement. But it starts out talking about the high priest and the articles that's in there, but then there's a switch. There's a switch to talking about Christ. And the Hebrew writer already built a case and telling us that Jesus is our high priest, and he's a priest from the order of who? Melchizedek. That's, I mean, he builds that case and explains that all to us. But whenever we get to about these verses, such as 12, we're actually reading here about Jesus. It's not through the blood of, of goats and calves, but through his own blood that he entered the holy place. Now, when did they enter the holy place? What day did they do that? On the Day of Atonement. So things are moving now. Now we are too, you know, we're looking at Scripture that's alluding to the Day of Atonement right here because that's when these things take place. All right, now let's go on and let's look at verse 24. And you guys can go read the whole chapter uh, later. We're just, we're kind of skimming it just to get some points made. And uh, let me read that. For Christ did not enter a holy place made by hands, a mere what? Copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hebrews 9.24. And then if we jump on down a couple more verses, in verse 26 it says, Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once, at the consummation of the ages... He has made manifest to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now notice that he says, but now, once, at the consummation of the ages. Now, there are some versions that I actually put at the end of the world there. You know, but it was actually the world uh, word on for ages right there. And uh, like it's uh, teleon, you know, for end or consummation right there. So, at the consummation of the ages. And he says, but now... Okay, is what he says. Once Jesus goes, and where did he go into? Well, you know, we may think, wow, this is a crazy picture right here. But it says that he didn't enter the tabernacle on earth, but he entered what? Into heaven itself, is what he says. So that's where he went. So you guys know that this ark, what did God say he was going to do? He was going to be dwelling in the cloud above it, right? So whenever they went in that room, now they didn't do a real good job with their with their, their, their fragrance, with their, yeah, their incense. I don't, they didn't have no cloud. I think you're supposed to have that pretty cloudy in there whenever you went in. And I don't know, they took something real small and went in. I, I really envision that you don't see well in that room whenever you go in. In fact, that curtain is thick. I mean, that curtain is super thick It's in there. So you don't, there's, there's darkness in there. And whenever they go in and they cloud that up, you know, it's, it's like the closest they can get to the glory of the Lord, and then they sprinkle that blood on there. I always wondered, this is just me, you know, you've got to think about this, that they didn't, I guess the blood built up over the years, right? Yeah, can't, I mean, you all know what I'm saying? Like, you, I mean, no, you don't have, like, nobody's going to go in there and clean. <laughs> you know, you're not allowed to. So I, I just can't figure that part out. Isn't it funny what your mind gets stuck on? And I got stuck on... On how, what do you do with that? Because it's there. I've thought about that several times. So, and we see this picture of Jesus making atonement for us. Now, all's fulfilled in Jesus, guys. You know, the shadow is over. The reality has come. I mean, and, and it's in him. And I'm saying that whenever I look at these scriptures right here, I don't see something that looks future. I see something that looks like that the Hebrew writer was telling about was happening. I don't see anything to really indicate that you know, well, he was going to do this at some point in time. I mean, he's saying, this is, this is what's going on right now. 
with that. All right, so we'll, we'll deal a little bit more with that. I was hoping I would actually probably cross the trumpet or the tabernacles, but it's not very big. And then we'll, we'll do some uh, stuff to kind of tie all this together. So, um, Jake, I guess I'm done for this half. All right, so uh, word the uh, Day of Atonement. Okay, so I don't know if you caught this part. The Day of Atonement's on the 10th of the month, and then we're getting ready to go to the Feast of the Trumpets, and the Feast of the Trumpets will be on the 15th of the month. No, I'm not going to the Feast of Trumpets. No, I'm not. I'm going to the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the direction I'm heading. We've already been to the Feast of the Trumpets. So... <coughs> Yeah, and I, I, you know, I can't tell you how hard this is for me to keep straight. <laughs> so I, I know it's it's difficult to try to take it all in. Um, so trumpets is on the first <coughs> of Tishri, our September and October, and then David Thomas is on the tenth, and then Tabernacles is on the fifteenth. But it runs through. It's another one of those seven day feasts. So you think about that, guys. You're you're three quarters through the month right there. So I don't know. I, you know, in that part, like I said, I don't understand that. I don't understand. And this is big happenings. You know, I always wanted to go to Flemingsburg Court Day every year, and it wasn't much. Y'all make fun of it, but I always wanted to go. It's what y'all probably think, well, he had to go to court every year. Poor boy. No. <laughs> no. A court day up around home is a big flea market the whole town has, and they got all this stuff out in the streets for sale. So they closed down everything, and you went to court day for two days, and they had them up around. We'd have them in Flemingsburg and Maysville and, and uh, Mount Sterling. We had our biggest area court day, and it still exists. Theirs don't. But, I mean, I always wanted to go to that. I mean, that was a big event to see. So I know these, these I know you want to go to this. I just don't understand how you, how you figure out your time schedule to be able to do it, including traveling back and forth. To me, it just seems difficult, especially whenever God required them to come back. Okay, so we are back in Leviticus 23. Yes. I think it would be best to take a look at this one in its entirety in 33 for 44. So if somebody would read that for us, it'll give us a pretty good idea about the Feast of Tabernacles. On the first day is a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work at <coughs> night. For seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord. It is an assembly. You shall do no laborious work. These are the appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations to present offerings by fire to the Lord, burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each day's matter on its own day. Besides those of the Sabbaths of the Lord, and besides your gifts, and besides all your votive and free will offerings which you give to the Lord, on exactly the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days, with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. Now, on the first day, you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall thus celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in booths for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths. So that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the sons of Israel the appointed times of the Lord. Okay, so basically that gives us uh, most everything that we would need to know about this particular feast. And, you know, we even saw the days in there. There's a couple of those Sabbaths, you know, put on it there at the first and the last again. And this time, we are going to build these little booths up here, or tabernacles. And um, I don't think that's in the city of Jerusalem. I think that's in somebody's backyard. The suburbs. <laughs> the suburbs. 
Uh, there's another picture of that one. Now go back to the picture before. I don't know. Y'all think that's the same one? Go back to that one. There's a floor down there. Go back to the other picture. Yeah. I, that, I think I did. I fell for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, you know, as you can tell by the inside of this one that is decorated for the Feast of Tabernacles, it was a celebration. And that's exactly what it was. In fact, um, I believe some of the priests called it holiday because they were very happy about this feast. This was a, a big, big celebration. People came to Jerusalem. I can just imagine what it looked like with all these little tents lining and everything. So you bring your family in there. I hope they let us bring our camper nowadays to it. But uh, <laughs> I don't. I think they would probably kick the camper out. They were in the spirit. But, uh, you know, maybe whenever I was young, it might have been fun with the boys, I guess, whenever I was still okay with sleeping on the ground. Nowadays, I uh, don't sleep at all in a tent, so don't look forward to things like that. But, uh, you know, this was a big thing right here to do this. So can you imagine that your family is going to get up and travel to Jerusalem, and you're going to stay in a tent that you make there, whenever you get there. And uh, it was, it was fa festive time, and uh, it was a celebration. And let's see here. This is where I've got some of that that I was trying to tell you about uh, about the names. If it's in it's in Exodus 23, verse 16, and this is the way I read it anyway. Okay, it says, uh, "Also, you shall observe the feast of harvest of the first fruit of your labors from what you sow in the field," and I, that I th is talking about. Uh, Pentecost. Okay, but then when you look down, it says also the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, which that would make sense that it is uh, tabernacles is what it's talking about. So that's the way I'm seeing that. So I'm gonna last night I put it ingathering with when I read it I thought that was all together. Now I think it's talking about the two different ones. Um, I do know this. I did just for a second and now it left me. Um, now I gotta think. See, I, I did know something that I don't know anything now. Let's see, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, the feast. Okay, well, that didn't help any. Um, the in gathering. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Yeah. So am I. Yeah. Oh, I know what it was. Okay, this this is one of the big deals is. This marks the beginning of their civil year, which to me was just really weird because, uh, like, Israel's civil year is at this time. And the first of the year, the head of the year, is at Passover. That's what God told them. So I guess I don't even understand that. So, like, their, <coughs> as far as their holy side, the beginning of the year is Passover, and as far as their civil side... It's here, and I'm honestly, I'm thinking it's tabernacles, but it, it could be the first of the month of trumpets. I'm not 100% for sure about that, but that's their civil side of starting things. So that's a little bit beyond me. I don't understand why you need two times to have a, a New Year's at <laughs> all. I, I, don't, I don't understand that, and I'm sure someone could explain it to us, but I'm not going to be that person. Okay, so let's go to Deuteronomy. We've talked about Deuteronomy 16, 16. We can learn a little more from... Uh, 14 and 15 here. So we'll look at that and see if it adds anything at all to us here. If somebody wants to read that for us. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants and the Levite and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your towns. Seven days you shall celebrate a feast to the Lord your God in the place which you which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. Okay, so I don't know if it added anything or not to it, but 
uh, you can see that everyone, everyone was to uh, celebrate this, okay? Like anybody around was to celebrate it. And whenever you think about it, in the order that it came in, you started out the month with kind of a dark note with trumpets because that had to be figured out. You got your two witnesses, yep, time, and blow the trumpets. So it's dark, and then by the 10th, you have what I think I would say is your most important day in, for the Jews, and that's Day of Atonement. Whenever atonement's going to be made, and it's that solemn day, the day that everybody's going to fast, and, you know, why would it be so important? Because atonement's being made for sin. I mean, you have to think about your sin, and everybody in uh, the country is thinking about their sin as that's made, and then what do you have? You've got tabernacles, you've got a celebration right there. So, to me, it kind of follows an order of in, in how it goes. Now, um, I think I told you this, but because of the joy <coughs> that was associated with the Feast of the Tabernacles, it became the most prominent of Israel's holidays, and it was simply uh, referred to as the holiday by ancient rabbis. So this was the one they really enjoyed doing and having. Uh, it was also a pilgrim feast. You know, it was one that they're going to come back to. And, you know, like I said, I'm not totally sure on how those things are looked together, but I kind of group them together. I've got Passover and everything kind of grouped together, and I've got Pentecost, uh, you know, it's all there by itself, and then I would think you're going to try to be there for the biggest part of things, at least from the Day of Atonement on, you know, you're going to try making it in for that, and see that. So, uh, what did it do? What did it commemorate? The end of the wandering in the desert of the children of Israel. And that took how long? Forty years. Oh my goodness. What caused that mess? Do you guys remember how they got in that mess to start with? Yeah, it was disobedience. They sent out those spies to spy out the land of Canaan. You guys remember that? Now, God had already told them that they could take that land of Canaan, didn't he? You know, he, he, he told them about the Perizzite and the Amorite and the thisite and thatite <laughs> that all lived in that land. And he's like, but I'm going to do what? I'm going to send my angel before you. So, I mean, they're, they're supposed to be able to... That, that doesn't mean they're not going to have to be a part of the battle. But it does mean that God says, you're going to be able to take this land. And then they go and spy out that land. And you remember what they saw? They saw those giants. And they said that we look like what? Grasshoppers. And we're going to die. <laughs> That's exactly what, what's going to happen to us. We're going to die. And then you've got, you've got who? You've got... Joshua and Caleb. And you got those two who say, no, we can take the land. Now, they did say some good things about it. You remember that? They said it is the land of milk and honey, just like we're told. There's all those kind of things here, but there's also these giants in the land. And you've got 10 of those people who went to, to go into that land. They send one from each tribe, and 10 says, we can't do it. We can't take that land. And Joshua and Caleb say, we can and, of course, Joshua would actually be the person who would lead them into that land, wouldn't he? He would be the one who would cross with them over the Jordan River, and they would start by taking Jericho. And you've got to think about this, but how do they take Jericho? They, they walk around it for seven days, and then they, on the, the last day, they do what? Yep, they blow trumpets not been used in many sources of fight of, <laughs> since that time. But they blow trumpets, and the walls fall in, and they are able to take the city, uh, and it's easy to see how God is with them at that time. But, you know, one of the events that takes place in there is uh, Joshua runs on to this, this person who is called the captain of the Lord's army, um, the captain of the host of the Lord's army, I believe. And Joshua asked, who are you? Are you for us or them? And he said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. I'm the captain of the Lord's army. I have no doubt that's that angel that was supposed to go before them, guys. He started with them way back whenever they were wandering out of Egypt. Can you imagine what the wait must have been like for 40 years waiting on these guys to get across the river? I mean, it took them a long time to get there to finally uh, raise up another crew to trust God. But that was the end of the wandering, so they were to celebrate that. And it was also the celebration of their inheritance and the entry into the promised land. So... Lots of celebration going on. Now, uh, following after the temple was destroyed, 
that basically uh, what is celebrated today evidently is radically altered from uh, what they did at that time. Without the sacrificial system in the temple, they just couldn't do it any longer. So most of these feasts have been majorly altered from what you would have seen in the Bible. And that is somewhat significant to this, uh, this study is the fact that they are altered from what they are and they simply can't do them. And we already talked about the fact they really don't even have a high priest to do them with. So um, basically, they're not there anymore. Well, let me show you. Uh, I, th I think I might have done this in the last class. This was probably the first time I was 20 years old. Yeah, yeah. I was 20 years old whenever this book came out. Um, I was a Christian, but I definitely did not know anything. You know, wasn't well studied on, uh, on anything. And uh, this book in... Uh, this time hit pretty big and Gina and I I believe had just gotten married you know we were newlyweds in 1988 and uh, at that time I remember whenever word started spreading about this what that you know basically the world was ending is how it was brought to me and it was ending sometime in September is when it was going to end and this was the first time, but they, they said, this guy has all these figures, and, you know, it started to make it around like that. And, you know, I was really, I was on edge for the next couple of days wondering, well, is this it? You know, is, is this it? Is this the, this the end? And, and my picture, I don't know, I pictured calamity. I just had all kinds of pictures in my mind uh, uh, of, of how things were, were going to be, and I was pretty concerned about it in September 11th, 12th, and 13th coming past and nothing happened. And uh, honestly, I think the next year he's got a book that came out, how this stuff will happen in 89. He was convinced he made a year error is what he had done. What I really didn't know at the time was what was in the fine print of the book. It says, look, look there on the front cover. I don't know what you can read about. It says 88 reasons why the rapture will be in 1988. And it says the Feast of Trumpets, September 11th, 12th, and 13th. Okay, now, first of all, you know, uh, obviously he was one of those who believes that everybody was going to be raptured up. So that's why they call it there. That, But that translated to me, into the world is what it translated. That's how I translated it in my mind, what was, what was happening. But what I didn't get was this Feast of the Trumpets part. Why, why did he bring that up in there? Well, mostly today in these dispensational circles, this is what they work from. They say, yeah, you're right. These feasts here have been completed, but these here haven't. So they tie these in with basically the second coming of Christ in one way or another that you'll see them tied in. But this was really, it was years later whenever I finally kind of, I think, you know, we started studying the tabernacle, and then I had some questions, some things I didn't understand, um, mostly about the Day of Atonement. And then the more I studied, I was like, hey, wait a minute. That dude back in 1988, I bet he was using some system like this. Well, sure enough, I hunted up the book. There it was. It was on the front title. Yeah, he was using this. This was how he was coming up with this system. Well, he's not the only one. Let's see what else we got here. All right. The day, uh, okay, let's see here. The day, the coming days of all. The end time scenario based on the Bible's fall feast. And then we got at the bottom here. Let me see if I can get these here. <coughs> Eclipse signs. <coughs> the rapture. Pole shift. The jubilee. Solar flower. Solar flowers? Is that right? No. <laughs> solar, solar flares. Demonic invasion right there. <clears throat> I, I'm going to get myself a copy of this. I mean, that's <laughs> scary stuff right there. Whenever you go to, and it catches everybody's attention, doesn't it? Whenever you start talking about this stuff and, you know, we start looking around and we start getting scared. But notice it says, based on the Bible's fall feast right there. So, you know, they start building these dramatic stories based on the fall feast and how these things, you know, kind of come around. And notice they put the Jubilee in there, okay? So it was tied in to that one there. And I, I'm not really, I'm not familiar with that one at all. All right, 
Oh, but I was a little bit familiar with this one because I remember whenever it kind of came out and uh, we had to, it, it made its way around church a little bit. I had to do, uh, we had to do a little bit of, of work on this, but, and it doesn't say it on there, but whenever you hunt for stuff, it always appears. And I don't, I don't have the book to see, but the four blood moons, something is about to change. Uh, I think this was at least 10, 15 years ago whenever that book was done by John Hagee. But it had a lot of fee spaces to it right there that, that he had done in there. And then do I have any more? Am I out? You're out. I'm out. Okay. I, uh, guys, I'm sure there's a lot more out there that's done. And that's why I say studying these things get really hard because the only people who's put any time in on them, you know, seem to be people who are, are looking for all this end time stuff. And that's the direction they're going to go uh, with it. So um, anyway... That was some of the first encounters that I had. Um, th this is, you know, it, personally, I think these things have to be all fulfilled. And while I don't have absolute answers, I'm pretty much thinking that, you know, in Christ, these things are fulfilled. I mean, you know, we're actually, whenever you read Romans 9, we'll look at that one more time uh, here in a few minutes. But whenever you read that, you're seeing this Day of Atonement. It can't be anything else but the Day of Atonement. Because that's the only time the high priest went in to the Holy of Holies. And it's showing that fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the work that he did that obviously started with the cross right there. So, Gina, can you, you got her next one. Strange things. Okay. And uh, I just, I just want to point out some stuff to you that's been recorded in, uh, in history. The Talmud. Does anybody know what the Talmud is? Well, uh, you know, other than constantly running into it, I don't. But here's the Talmud is kind of where all the rabbis write down their extra rules for the laws. You know, like we got the Torah, the law, okay? And the Talmud records all the extra stuff. And they record a lot of their history in there. There's the Babylonian Talmud and there's the Jerusalem Talmud. Uh, my understanding is at first it was kept orally. And then it was written down. So these books are pretty vast and they go back a long way. But the Talmud records four events that took place the 40 years between the time of Christ and the fall of the temple. Um, number one, they recorded that the lot for the Lord's goat. Now what's that talking about? Right? It's talking about that one that they marked Yahweh on. Okay, Those two goats they had, one was a scapegoat. Talking about it, it said the lot for the Lord's goat would always come up in the left hand, and they thought it was a good sign if it came up in the right hand. Now, everything I read about this, the reason they wrote this down, and this is actually written in two of their writings. It's written in, I think, both Babylonian and Jerusalem. And some of this stuff is referred to by Tacitus and Josephus. That the, so you got four different recordings recording this stuff, okay? So that this, these things were going on. The reason they write that, it's not like it came up that way once. From my understanding is it came up that way about 40 years. So they found it a little concerning that it kept turning up that way. Uh, the other thing, the scarlet thread on the temple door stopped turning white. That had something to do with that, uh, that, that, that thread that they put on that other goat right there. And they said in that time frame it quit turning white. Uh, from from red, which it had been it had done in the past, according to them, uh, the westernmost light of the temple menorah would not stay lit. We didn't talk about those things, but what is a menorah? All right, you know we can say the lampstand. All right, well in the in the temple they had I think several of those that lit, and they were absolutely huge. I mean they were. This was, you know, something that you noticed whenever you came and made the temple beautiful. And they said the westernmost light of that temple menorah would not stay lit. And the other thing that got quite a bit of attention was the temple doors would open by themselves. And let me see what else I've got in here about that. If I don't have it written down, we'll talk about it. All right. With uh, persons whose name I wouldn't even try to pronounce in the Jerusalem Talmud, wrote 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the western light went out and the crimson thread remained crimson and the lot for the Lord always came up in the left hand. They would close the gates of the temple by night and get up in the morning and find them wide open. So these were things that seemed to be consistently happening after basically uh, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection 
you know, that after, uh, you know, he's ascended to heaven, and then during this period of time, and they're recording, there's some weird stuff going on here with our temple and to do with our sacrifices. And I believe, I don't know, if I don't see it in here, I'll talk about it here in a second. Let's go on to something else. That's the Babylonian Talmud that had that in it. The R Jerusalem Talmud said, uh, oh, somebody read that for us. I don't even want to, I don't want y'all making fun of me, okay? So, who wants to read that for me? Said Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai to the temple. Oh, temple, why do you frighten us? We know that you will end up destroyed. For it has been said, open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. All right, and that, uh, that person was actually quoting a scripture there out of Zechariah that they knew, you know, what their end was going to be, but uh, that was written in there too. Now, one thing, I don't think I've got it, so I'm going to, they said that it took, wasn't like somebody say, hey, Jake, go close that door over there. Wasn't like that. They said like it took 20 men to shut that door. <laughs> it, was, it was a very big door to, to, to uh, shut, and, and they said, you know, they're, they're fighting that thing around, and then, you know, by morning, that thing is open. So this was like something that really, you know, bothered them there, uh, that these kind of things were going on. Uh, let's see. What, you know, are, are these kind of things so far-fetched that they're just too much for us to believe that they really happened and were going on at that time? Because now we're past, we're past the Bible time, so now we're just kind of reading what's going on. Uh, and, you know, we, we've got four different sources. Basically, that's telling us these kind of things is going on, and uh, this is what's happening every year. We're seeing these weird things take place, and we don't know what to think about them. And things keep getting worse with the Romans here, and uh, it's getting a little scary. But you can actually, there are forums that people debate around about these particular things. They talk about, well, they really say that, and the problem is that there's somebody else saying it. You know, like, Josephus is saying it, like, like Tacitus is saying it. And, you know, whenever you get, it's just like the, the Bible, whenever you have all these witnesses that are saying the same thing, usually if it's not true, then everybody's going to knock it out of the water whenever it's being written down, okay? Because they're going to know it's not true. So it, it lays the evidence that it, it's, uh, you know, probably true. But if we really struggle around with that, I do want you to think about this. Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. We read that before, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. So uh, God had a way of sending some messages. Now, one more thing I really want to do, just a couple more scriptures I'm going to pull around here on uh, just to have you look at. And that is in, I want to go back to that Hebrews passage and just dig in there a little deeper. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and let's go to verse 7 and 8. <coughs> and this is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7 and 8. It says, But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself, and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. Now let me tell you, the versions, depending on what you're reading, they really struggle around with this thing. Because you'll see some tenses that look past tense, but if you can catch this as it's said, it's more present tense than what's being said. And they do that because it's talking about the tabernacle. Well, what was standing at the time? The temple was standing. So they kind of push it around on that. But basically, it says the Holy Spirit, it doesn't say the Holy Spirit was signifying. It says the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. Now go with me down to Hebrews chapter 9, and let's look at verses 9 and 10. And once again, this is, you know, tenses are significant, which is a symbol of, for our present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. 
So the Hebrew writer is basically saying, we've got these sacrifices going on, and they're a symbol for our present time. They're going on, but they can't make the worshiper perfect, and they're going to be imposed on the body until when? The times of Reformation. Now, I'm going to say that the times of Reformation have had to come. And my proof is they don't do them anymore. They don't make gifts and sacrifices. Something happened, and they don't do that anymore. So therefore, this time of Reformation that's being talked about in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 10, had to be here. Now, once again, that Hebrews uh, 9.26 says, otherwise he would need to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifest to put away sins by his sacrifice of himself. So basically, Jesus Christ, at some point, somehow, some way, his blood was brought before the Father in heaven. And you can't help but think about that scene in Revelation in chapter 5, whenever that blood or that lamb standing as him slain shows up. You remember that scene? I think we read it maybe the first night. All right. So I think that chapter, you know, you can't get out of that chapter and say that's not talking about the Day of Atonement. Because we look, we know that's what it's talking about. And then we see Jesus' part in it taking place in the Day of Atonement. All right. We'll look at another one. We're not going to look really deep at this. I've been in this book. I know how hard it is. And my wife doesn't want me to spend any more time in it. She's already shaking her head. She liked the first part of Daniel. The part with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The part with the lion's den. She did not enjoy the second half where Daniel digs down in all these prophecies. But the book is amazing. Because, I mean, you see detailed prophecies about Alexander the Great. I mean, it, it, his prophecies will take you up to Christ. And so that, that period we, we, we say is empty in Scripture after Malachi, well, Daniel fills it in for us. He fills in in detail what's going on. But let's look at Daniel chapter 9, and let's look at verse 24, and somebody read that for us there. All right. Now, we picked up in verse 24. So how did this chapter start? In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is really concerned because there are other prophecies that's floating around that's saying that they were supposed to be in captivity from their, what happened to them or that whenever, whenever Judah got kicked out of, of uh, Judah. <laughs> that, yeah, well, anyway. Whenever Judah got kicked out of Judah by the Babylonian Empire and took them into captivity, they were supposed to be gone for 70 years. People like Jeremiah had prophesied that. Daniel knew that. Daniel's getting real concerned because it appears that 70 years have come and gone and they're still in captivity. And he's, he's, he starts this prayer to God that's worth reading. And it's in here and it is one of the most humble prayers because you know one thing Daniel does in this prayer is he prays not only for the people, but he considers himself one of the people. And that's so important to us as Christians. He does not separate himself out. He said, we've all sinned. You know, that's how he, he puts everybody. And you won't find, you read about Daniel, it's incredible. This the character. Of, he could have easily said, well, I know how bad they were, but give them a break, Lord. No, no, he, he says it's all of us. And his prayer is incredible to read. But then the angel Gabriel comes. said, we've heard your prayer, Daniel. And he's going to start telling him, look, this is what's going to happen in the future. And he said, 70 weeks have been decreed for what? The holy city and to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity there, to bring everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision and prophecy. So basically... You got 70 weeks there. Did I say 70 years? I meant 70 weeks. 70 weeks. And um, in this particular case, there's good evidence and understanding. In fact, we, we can know because of some of it, a week is going to equal a year in this particular incidence. So we're about 490 years is what we're talking about. Now, somebody read for us 26 of this text, and we'll get a little more of it, at least for what we're doing here.
Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Okay, so um, if we looked at all of it, we would have saw there's seven weeks, and then there's 62 weeks. So you put those together, you're to 69 weeks. So you're almost there to the end. Whenever, whenever we get there to that time, so whenever you're almost to that, it, you know, he said the Messiah will be cut off. And the people and the prince who is to come will we'll do what? Will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, people will, they're, they're, you're going to struggle around with a couple of things on this when you look at it. First of all, we're going to know this has something to do with Jesus. Okay? Now, I don't, I don't tell you that because you, if you read through the text, you're going to see the word Messiah a couple of times. They didn't have to translate that Messiah. They could have translated anointed one. In fact, I feel like they probably should have because anointed one shows up a lot in the Old Testament. They, you know, that's kind of an English translation thing that they said, well, it's talking about Messiah, so we're going to translate this particularly Messiah whenever they didn't necessarily have to. But uh, the first one that probably comes is probably Cyrus. And he's actually called God's anointed one. You know, that, that's what he's called. When, and he was the one who kind of helped get the temple all put back together, if you, remember, if you read through any of that story. So we get here to this and notice that this prince comes. And this prince will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. I don't know too many people who don't believe that was talking about Jerusalem right there whenever it was destroyed. What was to happen before that? To make an atonement for iniquity. In other words, whenever you read through this, by the time that God removed his temple, these feasts should have been done. Okay, that part should have been taken care of. In fact, everything else we read, whenever we get into Hebrews, it looks like they definitely were. And one place that we could back up to, you know, if, if we... There's a couple of statements by Daniel in here that Jesus actually referenced. If we went over to Matthew 24, 15, whenever Jesus is asked, you know, basically they ask Jesus, look at this temple, look, look how fancy it is, Lord. And he says, this temple's going to fall. They want one stone on another. They said, when's these things going to happen? So he begins to, um, to answer that. There's about three questions answered there. But before the temple goes, he begins to answer that. And in verse 15, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, what was spoken through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. So he brings that up in verse 15. Now, no matter what we think right there, we know that he's dragging up Daniel's prophecies. So we know that whatever was talked about in Daniel, Jesus is talking about too. And he's referring it to the temple and, the, and the, being destroyed, which is exactly what Daniel was talking about anyway. Now, if you go down to verse 34 of this text, verse 24, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. People have tried to do squirrely things with the word generation there. They've said, well, that means a race of people. And the Jews are still here. And then others have said, well, Jesus said generation, but what generation was he talking about? The gener you know, I mean, we, we've done crazy things. You know what generation Jesus was talking about? The same one he talked about in chapter 23. Nobody go back and read 23, and nobody questions the generation he talked to in 23. Whenever he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kill the prophets. How long I've longed to pull you together like chicks. You know, he tells them, this generation won't pass. And nobody doubts that one, but they get to 34 over here and try to throw it a lot of different ways. So for that, those reasons, which uh, we see in Scripture, I think there's plenty of reasons to say these, these things should be fulfilled. We ought to be done. One last reason that we have, one simple last reason, is the feasts are fulfilled in Christ and uh, they can no longer actually celebrate those today as they were commissioned by God. To me, that's the evidence. The proof is in the pudding. They can't do it because the temple's not there. And even if they build the temple back, they're not going to have a priesthood. You just can't do what God has removed and taken out of the way for us. All right. Guys, I'm to the end of this thing. I'm done. <laughs>